Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 55. Today we are going to be talking about the two newest expansions for Dominion Nocturne and Renaissance. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Greetings. And Ben. Hello. We haven't had you on the podcast in a while, Ben. It's It's been a minute. It's been a minute. This is, this, this is what the Californians say, and it is now invading our friend group. Thanks to Lindsay, I think, mostly. No, I think I thought it was Emily. Uh, em- Emily, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I haven't seen Emily in... In a minute? In, in, in a minute, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, of the kind of idioms that the cool kids are saying, this is one of my favorite ones. Really? I've it, happily it. A- adapted it. Really? Yeah. Adopted it. I I will never say it. Uh, really? Unironically. I... What if it's literally been a minute? Oh, you, ironically, okay. Well, I guess that would be unironically, but... Yeah. I mean, literally. it's an ironic statement. I will, either, I will either say it literally or to make fun of Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only two uses. I will ever use it, okay? Okay, fine. Okay. You can, you can stay with your principles. We'll be over here being cool. For a minute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Dominion. One of our favorite games. Still one of our favorite games. I had to remind people on Twitter uh, after we played the other night that Dominion is still brilliant. Still one of the greatest games ever made in these these times that we live in which Gen Con happens and people go to it and talk about a bunch of new games and get giant piles of games. Dominion is still probably at least top 20 best games ever made in the history of gaming. I think it'll be a very long time until it falls out of my top 20. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's also, um, I mean, it's also still king of its genre, which which helps. Apparently, that's, a, that's not a popular opinion anymore. Really? It's like everyone's got their, their favorite deck builder. I, I then, haven't played them all, but I have to say, every time that someone ha- has said that this game is, you know, the Dominion killer, I've I've been very disappointed. Yeah, I mean, I have games that I might like a bit better or close to Dominion that incorporate deck building. Like, I think Concordia is very good, Mage Knight. But in terms of being a deck building game, I haven't played anything that's come close. Yeah. Um, not that I dislike other ones. Like, I like, I think Star Realms is pretty good. Um, I think, what was the other one I played? Oh, Mystic Veil. Vale. I think that one's all right. I think it needs expansions, but it's all right. I mean, the variety and the concentration of the gameplay and uh, just the amount of strategy that goes into a game of Dominion is still so much better than anything I've played. Yeah. Yep, full full agreement. That, yeah. So that's where we're starting from. So if you hate our, our opinions on Dominion, you'll hate this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look actually at the at the metrics of the website, our most popular article ever is our Dominion reviews. That is uh, true. All of the expansions before the two wow. that we're going to be talking about. That's right. Um, it consistently gets the highest views on any given day. Uh, except for days in which a new article is released. It's but, the only written content that I have contributed. Yeah, you're you, you're 100 percent, Matt. But I, we I, the the two newest ones were not out at the time. We since have played them a few times. This past week, we played uh, two games of each of them, and then we played a 50 50 combined game and saw what 80 85 percent of all the cards in there. And then we've played them before. Uh, in yeah. another game night where we we focused on Dominion, what are your your first imp- or what are your impressions of these expansions? What are your what are your thoughts about them, especially in comparison to other expansions? Yeah, well, well, and also Ben's played them online. Ben Ben has the online. Oh, yeah, very true. Online. Yeah, so he yeah. he he has a a little bit of a um, <laughs> leg up on us on that. Um, I'll I'll just say real quick, my my big picture reactions are that they're both solid expansions i I think it's interesting i think nocturne is one of the most thematically delightful expansions whereas renaissance is one of the the least interesting thematically 
um, which is saying something. I, I, at least that's that's kind of my my first impression. That there could be some gem gems of theme hidden in there, but they both add a lot. But they they both feel they they both feel clean to play. Um, I, I I I compare the newer expansions back to Dark Age, uh, which was the first just really complex. Uh, yeah a level up of uh on the complexity scale yeah i think we described um, dark ages as dominion on hard mode yeah yeah <laughs> and it really feels like that these expansions both have the complexity without feeling as punishing to play <laughs> i don't know if i would agree with that i think nocturne is perhaps comparable to dark ages in complexity yeah, spiritual renaissance successor. seemed yeah. quite simple yeah you might be right there you might be right there yeah, I think I think you actually are cor- correct on that. Uh, it it does some interesting things, but yeah, um, I'm just scanning all the cards, and a lot of them, uh, not a lot of them, do do crazy things. How about you, Ben? Uh, have you played both of these expansions extensively online, or is it just Renaissance? I, I've played Renaissance a lot more, but over the weekend, I upgraded to the Gold Dominion expansion, which has all the currently available um, expansions. And I've been playing exclusively um, expansions that I hadn't played before. So Nocturne was in there. I also really hadn't had a lot of experience with Dark Ages or Adventurer. Adventurer is that what it was called? Adventures. Adventures. Yeah. So I've I've played I've played a lot of Dominion over the weekend, and I just kind of glancing through the the Nocturne list. I think I've played games with each of these cards at least a couple times. Um, so I think the biggest difference for me with Nocturne is that the I think the boons and the curses really make a big difference in how you view the game, maybe psychologically, but not so much of a difference in actual gameplay. I don't think they're actually really all that helpful, but I've found that I'm generally making choices about my cards involving the the boons and the um, the hexes. Uh, probably more than I should. Uh, just because they're kind you're of fun. right on with with them having an oversized psychological effect. I I yeah. feel the same thing. I mean, I don't think they're particularly game breaking or helpful. They're all just like a nice little thing, but it's all random, so you don't you can't plan for it. And like, if you get you know plus a coin when you already have eight coins, it's like, well, what am I gonna do with that? That's that's just a wasted opportunity. So it, it's kind of. We we should say so so Nocturne has a boon deck and a hex deck, yeah. and various cards will uh, either grant you a boon or will hex all of your opponents, which simply means you turn over the top card in the deck and you get a a random, generally small effect. And like I think the worst hex is effectively a militia. Um, like discard two cards, like that. That's kind of the scale that they're that they're punishing you on. And um, yeah, in boons, you know, you might what get get an action or get a, a money. It's kind of on that. Yeah, they so, yeah. The if you could plan for them, they would be like helpful. Trash but... a card. Yeah. Yeah. Or, so yeah. So it's not um, it's not game breaking, but there's a psychological element of randomness in a way that dominion has never presented randomness. I mean, th- there's certainly randomness in dominion. You shuffle your deck. Um, but the idea that you play a card that grants you something that you don't know exactly what it grants you, uh, has a, a psychological difference, I think. Yeah. That was going to be my comment about nocturne is that, in particular, there's a lot more complexity, but a lot of it is tied into these boons and hexes. And I think you're right that, at least in our games, it seems to have an effect probably not in proportion to the effect of the boons and hexes, because those... It's very rare that those will do something catastrophic. There's a one hex where yeah. you reveal cards from your deck until you get to the first one costing three or four. If you hit that early in the game, maybe that puts you a turn behind or turn or two behind uh, your opponents. If it hits like the right card and and you you lose some tempo there, 
that feels like the worst of them potentially. Uh, the the boons, you know, maybe you get to trash a card, um, uh, or there's one that's you discard three cards to gain a gold. Maybe you hit that like turn two or something, and uh, yeah, you're able to get a gold really early. But I think they're mostly just nice little things. And if you're buying the card to get the boon, you're making a bad choice. Unless it's the fool, I guess that's really the only. There's this card called Fool. Um, and when you play him, you get, uh, the status lost in the woods. And if you didn't already have that, you get to draw three boons and resolve them in any order you want. And then you get a recurring boon every turn. If you choose to discard a card, as long as you're lost in the woods. Yeah. So I think that's really the only card that it's worth it just for the boon. But then fool is a dead card in your hand unless someone else gets a fool. So it's. Like even even the one card that like that's the whole thing that the card does. It's still, I don't really think is worth it. Yeah, yeah, I I think they're interesting. Um, Pixie, they're they're definitely interesting. Pixie well, is a it's, two it's cost a new... cantrip that gives you lets you look at a boon and then you can trash the trash the pixie to get the boon twice. I don't know. That's interesting for a two cost card. There are definitely situations I'd do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't know enough to evaluate the power level of the cards yet. Yeah. Um, but I, I will say I think it's interesting that this late in the game, so to speak. Yeah, uh, they've absolutely. introduced an entirely new element of randomness to Dominion. Yeah, like before the people... Nocturne, the only randomness in Dominion is shuffling your deck, basically. So what you yeah. draw and perhaps what you discard off the top of your deck. I or mean, that- Dark Ages had a small amount with the uh, um, Survivor. What's the, the deck called with the brown uh, useless cards that you have to draw sometimes? Oh, Ruins. Yeah. Ruins, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, those are random, on but they're this not a level. Yeah. And I, I mean, don't think in these a, are in a particularly- super tight competitive game of Dominion, if you get the right boon that gives you the, the plus one money to be able to, to afford a province this turn, that can tip the scales. Um, sure. So that said, I think overall they're probably more psychologically effective than they are actually effective because if there's going to be a benefit or a detriment to the boon or hex, it's going to be exceptionally marginal. Well, um, not exceptionally guys- marginal. It's going to be marginal and not something that you can plan around anyways. So it kind of bleeds into just the inherent randomness of the draw. Like whether or not a boon or hex is going to uh sync up with whatever cards you have in hand or your turn to benefit you just feels like the same kind of randomness that created yeah. that hand in the first place. Yeah, very much if so. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, I'm yeah, on board. It, it, tacked on to me as a whole lot more randomness. It's just a lot more involving random draws. I I agree with that. Is all in all, I found that I really enjoyed the boons and hexes um, when we played the other day. Um, I largely stayed away from them, honestly. I didn't get to experience them personally that much, except when people hexed me. Um, and then <laughs> yeah. I think hexing the one time is we had lots of hexes, better. I was playing a strategy where I wanted tons of victory point cards in hand anyway. So if it was like, you know, trash a card, I could get rid of an estate or discarding. It didn't matter that much. Oh, uh, with the shepherd. Yeah, yeah, with the shepherd where I got to draw cards off of discarding my my victory point cards or yeah. whatever yeah. The, whatever category of card that is. I, I guess just to my surprise, I find that the randomness that it adds um, is acceptable and something I'm willing to, you know, lightly hedge around in my strategy. Um and actually enjoy it. I think when I first, you know, first saw that Nocturne had this added random feature, I was pretty skeptical. But I've come around to it. I honestly, Donald X keeps coming up with other, you know, random <laughs> things to add to Dominion. And yeah. this this is weird, but I'm I'm okay with it in in the end. Yeah, yeah. I I, um, I think of the of the two. So like of the two new things from Nocturne, this is definitely the least impactful. Because I think the night cards are just like so different than anything else 
Oh, I think um, anything, maybe maybe Nocturne doesn't need the boons and hexes or some of the little fiddly stuff that it has, but the night cards by far overcome any complaints I might have with Nocturne. I yeah, think the night cards are really, really cool. So what so that night- does is it essentially creates a new phase of the game. So normally in Dominion, you, you get an action. Uh, you get to play cards, an action card. Um, and then maybe it gives you more actions. You can play that out. Then you go to your buy phase uh, and you buy cards and then you just clean up. It's ABC is the uh, mnemonic they made uh, where you, you know, f- do end of end of turn stuff and draw new cards into hand. The night cards happen after the buy phase before the cleanup. And it's essentially it's kind of like a second action phase, but you can only play night cards there and there's no limit to how many you can play. You just play whatever you have in hand, which creates some new interactions that simply weren't possible before. Yeah. Um, so looking at like monastery for each card you've gained this turn, you can do something. Uh, and that can include, you know, cards you gain via action cards and via purchases. Um Stuff like that that introduces yeah. just like this twists on the gameplay, and it has cards. I'd say maybe a third of the night cards in the in the deck are gained to your hand. So if you buy one yeah. during the buy phase, you can then immediately play them after you're done yeah. buying cards. Yeah, uh, Den- which Den of can Sin is kind of boost the power of certain ones. Yeah, like D- Den of Sin is a five cost card that lets you draw an extra two cards your next hand. And it like it felt almost like every time I had five in my hand, I just wanted to buy that because I was setting myself up so well for next turn. And the more of those you get in your hand, like the, the great thing about night cards is you don't need an action to play them. So you will be able to play them every time. And it's always useful to get, you know, an extra card in your next hand. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I think. Den of Sin might be my favorite night card, although I my, did like the vampire it's as really well. really strong. But, my, yeah. My favorite, I don't know if it's the best, but my favorite has to be Crypt, um, which is that set, was really good too. set aside yeah. any number of treasures you have in play face down, and then while any remain at the start of each turn, put one of them into your hand. Uh, yeah. So, both, yeah, so you're all. basically cycling, you're upcycling all of your strong treasures into... Yeah. Your hand, or you're taking but, but a bunch again, of coppers that's... out of the game for a few turns. Like it's, yeah, yeah. I, I, again, that's good. an interaction that couldn't happen in in any other way. Um, a lot of these night cards are also duration when they affect future turns. Um, so yeah. durations are back. Uh, oh yeah. Before we it, get into more specific cards, jumping over to my impressions of Renaissance. I yes. was surprised at how simple this expansion was. Like, we haven't had a simple expansion since, what, Hinterlands probably was relatively simple? I would not say that. I think Hinterlands had a Hinterlands has a lot of weird interactions. It's not that... Then maybe but, but like Night Phase is inherently more complex. It adds complexity to the game. I would say Hinterlands, the cards just had complex interactions... So maybe we say Renaissance is the simplest since Cornucopia, which is fairly straightforward. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's really yeah. simple. It's like base game levels of simple. Yeah. Okay. The big exception to that is definitely the projects, the, the projects. And I think the artifact cards as well. Um, yeah. So the- but even those in terms of like an add on thing, it's not as complex as like the what was it? Empires had the the fifty fifty decks, or did that start an adventure? Oh yeah, um, I think the first five cards in a pile were one thing, and then the next five. The artifacts is when you do something, there's a special card that gets tacked onto that pile, and you know, like the flag. It's a capture the flag kind of thing, and the flag just gives you a plus one card at the beginning of your turn, or uh, when drawing your hand at the end of your turn. Like, it's not that complicated. But I'm looking at some of the effects here. Like, there's a card that's, yeah, Scholar, right? Discard your hand plus seven cards. Like, yeah. that feels a yeah. lot like Library. But Library is <laughs> much more complicated than that in terms of figuring out the implications. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Gain a card to your hand costing up to four. If it's a treasure, you get a villager. Yeah, it, villagers, I was just going to say, are one of the big m- mechanics added. They're basically a, a token that you can save uh, for a plus one action at a later time. Corresponding to coffers added in guilds, which you could save for uh, plus one money at another time. Uh, but the villagers are really easy to understand. You get a you get a villager and then you've saved an action for later on. Um, there's some strategic complexity that that adds, but... Actually, now uh, that I'm looking at the list, there's a lot of cards that have similarities to base Dominion cards. So, like, Scholar's kind of like Library. You've got... Old uh, Witch, which is I like I saw witch. one that was similar to Bridge. Oh, yeah, like that's Inventor. Inventor, gain a card costing up to four, then cards cost one less this turn. Well, Bridge was Intrigue, not Base, but yeah. Well... I kind of blend those two together. They're they're interchangeable in my mind. That era. <laughs> um, yeah, there's experiment, which is basically kind of an adaptation of laboratory. I haven't read, yeah. I haven't read uh, any designer diaries on this, but as I'm looking at the list here, and as I'm thinking about the cards we played with, I wonder if this was designed as kind of an alternative to some of those early dominion cards yeah and if you look uh, actually it just as i'm looking at them i'm seeing connections like cargo ship and sh- swashbuckler are like right out of seaside, seaside. yeah and, and i wonder old if this witch, is which in... literally references witch it's very similar to witch yeah well there's also a young witch in um one of the early ones as well yeah um, i mean we were talking yeah there's a young witch uh we were talking earlier about like what kind of is the renaissance theme maybe it's literally an update right because it's the first thing it's the first expansion to progress the game in terms of the setting uh in forward in time it's always been kind of dark ages yeah to medieval and now it's the renaissance maybe the idea is that it's just a progression of cards we've seen before yeah Maybe it's a, it's a, that would make it a bit more of a it's all, it's really meta actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I do want to say just from a purely I mean that's isn't that similar to Coppersmith? S- say what? Say it again and what it does. Ducket. I don't know how you pronounce that. The two yeah, I don't. Do that isn't just there an lets early you... card that lets you trash coppers. Coppersmith. No, that's lets you not... take all of your the coppers from your discard in your I hand. You have a different one, money no, lender. Money, money, money lender. Money lender. Yeah, isn't right? Like Duke, it looks like money lender. Um, very mm, vaguely. I, I think it functions. That, so that's way. that effect is only when you gain it. So it's basically replacing the copper in your deck. It's not really allowing you to trash. And it's just a, a, an upgrade to a, a copper, basically. Uh, so let, let's right, it's a copper the, that gives you a yeah, I suppose money later and buy. But the coffers are you know the coffers which are money tokens are, are strictly better than coppers. In so I, in kind of summary, like I would say, the majority of the cards in this set would feel at home in some early set. I think that's absolutely oh true. yeah. In terms of you know those first three are kind of your standard to me dominion intrigue and seaside feel like prosperity basic dominion the, and maybe would it's you just put, like the time i played dominion most online and those are the ones i was largely playing with um but those three sets feel like kind of the fundamental core of dominion and this harkens back to that a lot yeah yeah i would agree with you so i think the biggest exception is the projects which follows some of the recent sets in adding these kind of outside effects that you can buy um where did the, did that begin in empires adventures had events oh that's right empires had landmarks which affect scoring but you don't you don't buy them and there was one more is it oh is it guilds that has the cards that you can you can buy every turn so guilds is the one i've played the least by far oh man this later set n- knowledge is uh <laughs> shaky let me let me take a look at guilds yeah, so Adventures had the events, which you could buy once per turn, or multiple times. It varies, but you could right, you could it was buy just them a multiple one-time times. effect. Yeah. Oh, I guess uh, Empires. Oh no, Empires had landmarks. Oh. Okay. Which changed like victory condition stuff for everyone. You didn't buy into them. Right. Yeah, those are. It also had wild. events. It, it also it had changes a- the game a lot. 
which were adventure again. Okay, maybe those are all of the out of game. Yeah, it must uh, be these last four sets. And frankly, yeah. in, in, in some sense, and again, it's probably just because of my playing habits where I kind of picked the game back up when you got adventures and we played a, a good amount in, in spurts here and there. But these last four sets kind of feel combined to me. I guess there was, like time-wise, there was a gap between Dark Ages and Adventures, right? A bigger gap than normal? Uh, I forget. Um, there they sl- s- slowed down a bit there for a while. Yeah, I think I think that's right, Mark. I think wasn't Adventures the first one that was like past the original plan? Yeah, we're looking at one every six months or so uh, through guilds, and then there is a two-year break between guilds and Adventures, and then there's been roughly one per year since then. Yeah, these later sets have all added these kind of outside of the supply effects that you could interact with projects from renaissance you buy once and then you put a token there and then they they give you an effect for the rest the rest of the game sometimes it's optional and sometimes it's not which yeah is really interesting because some of the projects are like trash a thing at the beginning of your turn yeah and i i got i didn't realize that that was not optional one of the times i played it it was like one of the first times i was playing renaissance and like late game you end up like with a hand of like two provinces and three golds, and then you have to trash a gold, and you can't buy another province because you only have six money. And it's like <laughs> it, it it really like you cannot go for a streamlined deck if you take Cathedral, which is the project, uh, which is really tough because having that where you're trashing something every turn kind of forces you into a streamlined deck. So I think that. I almost feel like that one is never worth it to buy, and it might just be a bad project, which is kind of interesting because I don't, know, I, I don't really think there are. It's, I see that, and I think to myself, I want to make that work, you know? Which, yeah. I, I which think is you can something make that work. I love in Dominion. Dominion gives me that feeling so often. Yeah. You could be right, Ben, but I really want to make it work. I've, I've tried to make it work a few times, and then, then I just gave up because there are easier ways to win. With projects uh, compared to the other outside of the kingdom pile effects that we've seen in the in the last four expansions, I think they're my favorite. Yeah, like the event I... seemed just needlessly complex. It was just like it's just like having more cards in your deck that you can optionally play or buy into, which it was okay. The Dark Ages thing is cool. Was it Dark Ages that has the victory condition stuff? We just looked at this. Empires, landmarks. Sorry, empires um, with landmarks are cool, but I don't want to play with those all the time because they, they're so radical. The projects in terms of, okay, I'm opting into this thing that kind of dictates part of my strategy. That feels the best to me. I, I love it. it, it in it's line a, with kind of how strategic Dominion is. Exactly. Generally. Yeah, because because you look at the, the board at the beginning of the game and it's a big strategic decision if if you're going to build your deck for one of these projects. Project. Yeah. And um, again, if you're looking at Renaissance as kind of an alternative starting point or an alternative early expansion to kind of the standards that people bring up, like Intrigue or Seaside or Prosperity, uh, I think are the ones typically mentioned. I think that works really well because part of the learning curve in Dominion is understanding that it is a highly strategic game. And... Compared to most people, I think I played Dominion relatively more tactically. I have ideas of strategy, but I try to be adaptable. But still, Dominion is a very strategic game, and getting like the uh, one of the first hurdles to get past when you're learning how to play Dominion well is understanding I need to have a plan going in. It's not just what is the best card I can buy at the time. That's not going to get you very well. You need to plan to buy cards that that reinforce each other when you have projects and a lot of them you can fashion strategies around that reinforces that idea of oh i need to have a plan for this from the beginning and 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 the question is am i going to invest in one of these projects or not because the opportunity cost is obviously one of your card buys probably early in the game because typically you want these early because they're they're long-term effects they happen every turn some of them a couple of projects cost eight, so you're actually giving up on a province. Yeah. 
So that's that's a huge opportunity cost. I didn't see that one before. That's yeah, that costs eight. It's a throne room. It's every incredible. Turn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First time you play an action card, you play it again. Which which is so cool. I mean, if if you're going for that, you know, maybe the kingdom lends itself to just buying a handful of really powerful action cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that could could work. Um, That's a super interesting restraint that you're putting on your strategy for the entire game. Yeah. The six cost By choosing to buy in. Like, I haven't played with many of these projects. The six-cost six ones are super interesting. Um, and, and for those who have played Dominion know that anything that costs six is very tricky because your opportunity cost is buying a gold there. But there's one that just gives you an, an additional action each turn. Another one lets you discard a victory card for two card, uh, plus two cards. And then the third we one, actually every, the first time you gain an action card, you set it aside and play it. Um, immediately like that's some strong stuff there i think those are well well costed there to tempt you out of a gold buy so it sounds like we're all in agreement um the projects are a a fun addition a successful addition um oh absolutely i think they're by far the best part of renaissance the actual uh, cards of renaissance kind of disappointed me i was i actually i I think my expectations were poor Okay, I, ben? I think some of the Renaissance cards are actually some of the best. Like, I, I don't think there's another set that has as many good two-cost cards. And I think they have some really interesting uh, decisions in some of the higher-cost cards, too, with, like, Flag Bearer and Treasurer. Um, like, Spices is a really interesting one, too. Like, I think they may not be flashy, but I think they're just straight-up good. I... I, I was gonna ask what you guys thought about artifacts. Well, yeah, right, but, yeah. But Ben, one of the two cost cards is that border guard, which played yes. a big, big role in our game the other night. One of our games, plus one action, reveal the top two cards of your deck, put one into your hand, and discard the other. If both were actions, take the lantern or the horn, and these are kind of these are artifacts that only one person can have at a time. The lantern. May, allows you to draw three, choose one with all your border guards, and the horn uh, allows you to what? Basically top deck a border guard every turn. Every turn, yeah. So it's this two cost card that if you can, if you're the one that gets in on it and no one else does, you can you can boost it up to where it's far more valuable late game. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. which is something which, that I did. Which, which it's it's that's super interesting. I think it's really successful and something that there's a dynamic there that you could only do with these artifacts that get passed around. Yeah, I think the artifacts work pretty well. It's some it's fun stuff. I think looking back at the cards and now understanding that this isn't supposed to necessarily tie in with with you know everything since Dark Ages forward has been on the more complex side. For Dominion, uh, this is kind of returned to something simpler. Looking at it that way, I, I would be interested in playing this more. At the time, uh, this past week, I was a little bit disappointed because I wanted something more sure. complex yeah. and more meaty, and I w- I wasn't expecting a simpler set. Yeah, yeah. I I will say, having played this quite a lot online, of of the what are there twenty five cards in this set? There's only about four or five different cards that i haven't like completely based a strategy around in this set which Hmm. is incredible because like it's so versatile that's Um, really interesting because like in 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 almost every game like i've can whenever any of these cards are there i've always like strongly considered like it not it's not going to work in every game but there's all there's almost always been a situation where I have bought multiples of these, I think cargo ship villain and sculptor and scholar are really the only ones that I can't remember a time that I've made them a major part of my strategy. Cause I just don't think they're 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 nice to have one or two of, but I don't think you can do something successful with them long-term. Um, but everything else has a lot of potential. So Ben, would you say that this is one of your favorite expansions? <sighs> oh man. I, it, it's been a long time until this year. I haven't really played Dominion with any regularity, 
but this is a really good one. Uh, I think the the cards are just on point. Um, the projects are great. Uh, I, it's it's definitely up there. I, I don't know that I would say it's my favorite, but it's 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 probably one of them. Yeah, because because before this, your favorites were what Cornucopia and Intrigue. Uh, Hinterlands was in there too. I Intrigue was like kind of the first one, and it had two of my favorite cards of uh, Masquerade and Minion. Um, mm-hmm. But I. I really like these cards. Um, like they, a, a lot of them just feel so good to play. I love, I love getting research early in a game. I, I think that's one of the the more fun cards. It lets you trash a card, and then you put as many cards as the card you trash cost on top of it, and draw them into your hand the next turn. So, it's it's a great way to get some use out of your estates early on. And yeah, there's just so many good cards in this set. Going back to Nocturne, or yeah, going back to Nocturne, let's let's look at some cards in particular that we think are interesting. As Matt mentioned earlier, Nocturne has got to be the most thematic set of Dominion by far. And I think yeah. we're all of the opinion that Dominion is much more thematic than its reputation would suggest. People always poo-poo Dominion because, oh, there's no thing to it. It's bland. You know, nothing really matters. You you can't look at Nocturne and say that's true. Like, you're just being willfully ignorant at that point. Uh, I will admit the art of Dominion is kind of bland, and the setting is kind of bland. But as a whole, I think the setting is actually really cool for Nocturne. This kind of, like, zombie, you know, zombies and vampires and werewolves and such. But in terms of the effects being thematic, and we talk about thematic theme being effects or aspects of a game that make sense in gameplay with their setting, Nocturne's awesome. Uh, I I tweeted about Werewolf, which is just a a great card. I mean, I don't know how strong it is necessarily. It seems decent for a five-cost card, but it's a card that can be played as an action aka in the daytime or as a night card at the nighttime the night the night effect is giving every other player a hex uh which is the werewolf part the action uh part you know you should have to choose between the two the action part is plus three cards uh if you look on the art for werewolf you will see that the werewolf person is in fact a smithy the card from the base game of dominion that gives you plus three cards that's just awesome. That's brilliant. It's That's so brilliant. cool. Vampire so is cool. I love vampire yep. because it turns into a bat, literally. Once you play the card, you exchange it for a bat card. Uh, and then once you play the bat, it turns back into a vampire. That's awesome. There's so much good stuff like that. I think uh, a quick note on on Dominion and theme um, as we slowly develop our our take on it over the course of a couple of years, um, small comments and random episodes. The thing about the theme in Dominion is it's so it the theme almost kind of comments on the game itself, um, because it is such a tight mechanical game that could just be you know cogs and gears turning in your head. A lot of the theme is just kind of almost commenting on that 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 structure like the werewolf it doesn't help me under it doesn't help me understand what the card's doing there's nothing thematically um interesting there about drawing three cards and werewolves there's just not but it's that kind of internal commenting on the werewolf is a smithy which you already know draws you three cards Maybe, maybe like another example would be the magic lamp heirloom, where if you if you hit some really difficult condition, you get three wishes. I don't. What is a wish? Well, it turns out it does something really really cool. I I don't know. Again, it's just it's it kind of comments on 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 the mechanical bits. Uh, Does that make sense? Do you guys? Well, I think the theming in Dominion and the way the theme is played out is the opposite of the way most games that are thematic accomplish their theme. Most games accomplish 
a sense of thematicness by being th- thematic in a macro sense. In other words, while the individual yeah. things you're doing by themselves may not be particularly thematic, you get the feeling that you are, you get the same kind of feelings as your character in the game. So, like, let me think of an example here. Let's talk about something, I don't think it's particularly thematic, but but it does, has some of this macro theme without any micro. And that's Zulkin. The macro theme of Zulkin is that you're trying to manage this Mayan civilization or group. I don't know. It's not particularly clear. And you're trying to balance kind of progressing your culture and civilization um, in terms of their ability to grow crops or acquire resources, as well as like cultural significance things like being favorable with various gods that they worship or acquiring in these crystal skulls that they that they deem significant so in that sense it's it's it has some of the same ideas of, of like civilization games where you're balancing and, and then Zulkin obviously you're balancing that against kind of just the hunger needs of your people in that you have to feed them but in terms of the micro theming like what you do each individual action that has nothing to do with anything this, is, this whole gear set up and you're like either placing or taking away your <laughs> your workers or your 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 pieces so in a macro sense there's some theme there in zulkin but on a turn by turn sense there's not in dominion no one ever feels like they're like developing a kingdom but on a turn by turn basis a lot of the cards have really cool neat thematic effects so the idea of like the magic lamp giving you three wishes is really cool how that factors into a game in which you're like buying duchies that that's where it falls apart. Sure. Right? The yeah. idea yeah, that yeah. like I, that like I'm an individual it. like what I'm looking at here, Night Watchman costs the same as or similar to a ghost town. Like that doesn't none of that makes any sense. Within the micro plane of the cards, there's some really cool theming. I think you you've said in a in a different way, a better way, um, what I was trying to get at. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Matt. Yeah. I that's my yeah. job. Anyway, we we love we love the thematic bits, especially in Nocturne here. Hey, there's a, there's a card called a lucky coin. It's a copper. When you play it, you gain a silver. It helps you find <laughs> other coins. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, so the lucky. best one's the fool. Yeah, He's the super lucky fool. <laughs> He's the one that gives you the Lost in the Woods card. And he gets lost in the woods and he keeps stumbling onto these boons. He never gets in trouble, (laughs) but he's an idiot. Yeah, he he literally can't do anything. (laughs) Yeah. There's actually a lot of positive effects all the time. I mean, the hexes and the boons actually work very well thematically. I think a lot of the cards that interact with them put a smile on my face. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How do you guys think the heirlooms play? So heirlooms are connected to certain supply cards. So if a certain card is in the supply, such as the cemetery, you will then replace one of your coppers in your starting deck with an heirloom. In the case of cemetery, it's the haunted mirror, uh, which gives a small effect. Um, I think these play fantastically. Do you guys enjoy these? I think anything that disrupts the two opening turns of dominion is interesting because yeah. before that those two opening turns was such a fundamental idea to dominion that you're always going to get either a two five split with your money or a three four split and then and understand the, split, the importance of those first two buys yeah. anything that throws a hijink into that i love which was first hinterlands with mm-hmm. the with the gain to the top of your deck card that gave you plus two money. Nomad yes. Nomad Camp, I think. Yeah. But yeah, but the but things like this more directly. I think this is way more successful than the The Ruins? The Ruins from Dark Ages, which replace the estates. I, I agree. The, these just yeah, give you an interesting most of them give you kind of an interesting set of decisions right in the first two hands some of them are more long term the the pasture for example is worth one per estate you have so you're not really thinking about that the first time through your deck but 
Yeah. It's still interesting because you can use it if you get Shepard, like in later turns, it's both a copper and a victory point card and that you start with it. So it, like with, with things that affect victory, po- it, 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 yeah, it's just really interesting. I, I think they're only, they're only good things. Even if some of them aren't really all that helpful, I really liked the cursed gold. I think that might be the most interesting oh, that, of them to me. That, that was crazy. Cause you get a gold in your opening 10 cards, but every time you play it, you get a curse. Yeah. 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 Uh, but in any game, you know, in a game without trashing, that could be a tough decision. In a game with trashing, that just accelerates your yeah. early turns really quickly. I have played with that card in a few games where there was no trashing for curses. Like you could trash coppers, but you couldn't get rid of your curses. Um, and it, like, you really have to be very judicious about when you play it. Yeah. It's, it's good. Uh, any particular cards in Nocturne that you guys love? Yeah. Um, Go for it, Ben. I, so we didn't, we played with this one, but I don't think anyone bought it. Um, but Necromancer has so much potential. Um, you bought so it, that. I, I bought it, but I didn't really play it that much. Um, but I've played a few games with it online now, and who boy, is it strong. So what Necromancer does is it lets you, um, when you play it, you can play an action card from the trash, and it starts out with three zombies that are in the trash. Um, and one of the zombies lets you trash an action card from your hand um, for plus three cards and an action. And so if you if you do that, you can get another action card that's basically Necromancer is just a placeholder for whatever action cards you want. So if you trash a bunch of action cards with Zombie Apprentice, which is the plus three cards plus an action, which is just a really good card anyway, you basically turn your Necromancer into whatever action card you want it to be. Um, oh, that's, that's so it's like a tragic. wild card action card. But then anyone um, else who's buying necromancers th- can use your use, this is use true. the trash. Yeah, this is true. That's um, so it, it's a it's a it's not a it's not something specifically for you. That that makes I, me I think. Really... Some of the some of the interaction player interaction in these new sets is just new and and unique, and I like it. This is a a, a great example. Um, yeah. And I, the uh, the artifacts, you know, that get passed around are, are another thing where how the fool is another example where how much something is benefiting to you depends on whether another player is going to join you. I don't know, that's interesting. But I, I had a really interesting interaction with I, I forget which one it is. What's the one that has the the step up cards where you, like you start with a peasant that gets upgraded to a soldier that goes. That's an adventures. Yeah, so in Adventures, I had, it was like, there was the token that um, you can move a token to a pile, and whenever you play a card from that pile, you get plus one action, or plus one card, or whatever. So I did that with Necromancer, and I had, like, I had purchased a bunch of Necromancers and trashed them, so I would play Necromancer, and I would choose to play from trash Necromancer again. So I, I, I think I had trashed, like, four Necromancers, so... You just play each of those four necromancers in trash each time, getting plus one card because you put the token on necromancer. <laughs> and it, <laughs> it, it was and like every time I played a necromancer, I just got five cards because you can just keep on chaining it in the trash. Um, it, it's yeah, there's that was probably the most fun interaction I had, but it, it's I think it's a it's an incredibly flexible card because there's yeah. no upper bound for the cost limit like there's a couple other cards from other sets that say like you know this card can be any card that costs less than itself but this is the first one that i've seen that lets you just play it as any action which i think is great i think if you're looking at nocturne you have to you have to mention changeling yeah yeah that's That's a very interesting card uh so it's it's a three cost card it has a night Place. effect of trash this gain a copy of a card you have in play. Uh, so in kind of as as a baseline idea of what it can do is that if you buy an early gold, it can become a gold or, you know, a different another action card. And then underneath it says in games using changeling, when you gain a card costing three or more, you may exchange it for a changeling. 
which syncs really good with some of the cards that do something when you gain them, uh, which was in this set and in was introduced in an earlier set, I believe. For example, Skulk costs yes. four. When you gain this, oh, you gain yeah. gold. <laughs> yes, uh, which is yeah. a wonderful interaction. So you get a changeling, you buy a Skulk, which only costs four. Gaining a gold. Gaining a gold, and then... Not getting Skulk, but getting a Changeling, which you can then Straight use in for gold. <laughs> to turn that into another gold with the gold that you just got. Not on that turn, but uh, yeah. future turn. Yeah. in a future turn. Really fun stuff there. Uh, yeah. I, I had a lot of fun with Changeling. Another one I wanted to point out in, as I said, I'm, I'm a pretty... I enjoy teasing out kind of middle-of-the-road strategies in Dominion more than most players who try to go for a combo. Um, and I think I'm decent at it. Uh, a card that's really, I think, has a lot of that kind of marginal potential. Again, you know, as with most Dominion cards, highly dependent on whatever the other cards are in the game. Uh, but Secret Cave, I think, is interesting. Oh, yeah. It's a cantrip, so it's plus one card, plus one action. So it replaces itself uh, without any cost. Um, and then it says you may discard three cards. If you did, then at the start of your, your next turn, plus three money. It's one of the cards that emphasizes kind of w- one of those tenets of Dominion, which is that one bad turn and one good turn is better than two mediocre turns, which I always like playing around. And it yeah. is a soft protection against attacks, especially ones that give you curses. Or as we, as I played with a bit in one of our games, uh, with strategies where you're where you're accumulating victory cards. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it has it's kind of a soft protection card uh, with some potential upside. But worst case scenario, it's just a cantrip. Um, so again, depending on the kingdom setup, I think it could be secretly like low key really effective. Yeah, Mark. Actually, Secret Cave was the one that I was going to point out. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. In, in, in general, I think this is a pretty solid set where there are no cards that I just adore of, other than werewolves theming <laughs> that, that I really adore above the rest. They're all just really interesting cards. Uh, but Secret Cave, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Mark. It's just a really interesting, it's not amazing, but you can have one bad turn and then get a good turn. Uh, I'll point out that the, that it comes with an heirloom, the Haunted Mirror. Uh, so again, repl- this will replace uh, starting copper. And it's it's a copper, but when you trash it, you may discard an action card to gain a ghost from its pile. And then the ghost is this spirit that um, is a very powerful knight card. Yeah. I really like you throne spirits. room in action in a future turn. Yeah, it lets you throne room in action. So it forces you to. If it's, yes. <laughs> so Secret Cave yeah. is just an interesting middle of the road card, as you described. It it, it comes with this uh, cool cool starting uh, heirloom that could possibly give you a ghost. It also tells a really sweet story of you know, oh yeah, the you go into a cave, who... you find a lamp, you destroy <laughs> it, and then a ghost haunts you. Yeah, and in the art of the the haunted mirror, you see the ghost. So it's just, <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. Although it ends up being a friendly ghost. Yeah, the ghost was was your, was your bud the whole time. <laughs> unless you unless you turn over a card that forces you to trash cards in your hand when you can't trash cards. Yeah. Uh, well, or I suppose the ghost was perhaps trapped in the mirror and you freed it. There you go. There you go. There's there's the story of Secret Cave. Any other cards you guys wanted to point out in Nocturne? I just really like Shepard. I think we talked about it a little bit, but ah, Shepard is super fun. It's it's a really versatile card. Um, yeah, I don't think I think where... you have to do Shepard and something else. Um, I don't think it's enough to get you there on its own, but it has great potential. Yeah, Shepard. Uh, for those who don't know, is a four cost card. Gives you one action. You discard any number of victory cards, and you get plus two cards per victory card you discard it and then it gives you the heirloom of pasture which is a copper that's also a victory point uh, so it gives you one additional victory card to that you start the game with and it's uh, also worth one per estate so it effectively makes all of your estates worth two 
Yes, uh, which was my strategy in the game where we played that, and I, I thought it was fairly effective. Uh, moving over to Renaissance, any particularly enjoyable cards from there that you guys like? <laughs> All of them. Try to, try to keep it under an hour, Ben. <laughs> Let's see. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you three. How's that? There you go. Um, Border Guard. I'm not going to talk about, but that's that's great. We mentioned it before. Um, the one with the lantern. Or the yeah. One. I think Mountain Village is probably my favorite village that I've seen. Mountain Village is plus two actions, and you can take any card from your discard, which means it's really great if you get it late in your deck. If you get it early in your deck, you may be in trouble. Um, you, if, if there are no cards in your discard, you can always draw the top one from... You, you, you draw the top of the pile, so it's not like you're stuck. But Mountain Village, I think, is can be really really good yeah that's um, strong almost to the point that i kind of feel like it should maybe cost five but it doesn't so. but as we know the costs in dominion don't matter that much <laughs> scepter is a really fun treasure it's worth plus two or you can replay an action that you had played earlier in your turn if it's still in play um so that could like let you do all manner of things depending on what actions you had played. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, a safe silver if, if not. So th those are probably the three that I like a lot. I mean, I, I talked about research a little bit earlier. Treasure is just flat out good, but I, I think border guard mountain village and scepter are just oh. probably the standouts of the set to me. I, I just have to point out the one project that we played with capitalism. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, which <laughs> completely changes the game. Yeah, it so again, projects you can you can buy once and then you get the effect. It costs five, but it says during your turns, actions with plus money amounts in their text are also treasures. So first comment is, um, I'm 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 really into magic right now, and I think Dominion was very inspired by magic. Mm -hmm. And this card really shows how much Dominion took from the design of magic. Basically, this card changes the type line of a certain subset of, of cards, which gives a crazy effect. Um, so because these actions become treasures, it now means that you can play them in your buy phase. You don't have to spend an action for them, but you still get all of their effects um, so when we played played this, a, a strategy emerged where there were enough of these plus money cards that you could build a strategy around just turning them into treasures so that you could, yeah. you could, you could play well, them. Well, there's one card called Treasurer that, I mean, combos with that insanely because it's, yeah. it's a five cost card. It's plus three money. And then it's it says choose one, pool. trash a treasure from your hand or gain a treasure from the trash to your hand or take the key, which I think it gives you one money each turn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the strategy there is you get capitalism and then you just buy treasures and trash all your uh, other money. And then you just and have a bunch of cheap value golds. The the absolute bonkers thing about a treasure combined with capitalism is that if you have to trash a, an action card that has like plus money in it for, you know, some reason, like let's say you're playing with a remodel, you can get it back. It's not like you're losing that card. Like you just get it back next time you play Treasurer. Yeah. So like, <laughs> it's insane. And then, like, and then you play it for money. That that buys. Yeah, sense. that yeah, exactly. It's it it's it's so good, so strong. Yeah, so, situational. Like, I think in 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 game in some games it's actually not not beneficial to get. Um, but I think. Yeah, and I wouldn't want to play with game. capitalism every time I play, but it's Definitely just one, not, no. you know, it's one of 20 projects, and, and I think the recommended numbers, you play with two of them. Um, yeah. Uh, but but I, I think boy, capitalism... did, did it warp the strategy in that, <laughs> in that game, which was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. C capitalism is the most dramatic change um, of all the projects. I don't think there's any any other one that changes the game quite as much as capitalism does. But I mean, it's, it's assuming you so have plus money cards in your kingdom. Sure, yeah. Which which I, Renaissance I, has a number of. Uh, so if you're yeah, solely Renaissance, you're almost certainly going to get one. 
there's one, two, three, four, five. I I almost six, feel like seven you, of them. It looks like if you drew if you drew Ren- or if you drew capitalism and you had no money cards, I I don't can't imagine why you wouldn't just draw a different one. I, I think every time I've played online, there's been at least one or two. Yeah. Uh, money cards. Maybe, maybe that, that that's possible that that's in the rules for the set that you only play with it if you're using money cards. Mm-hmm. Um, plus money cards, that is. Yeah, I think there's just enough cards that you're going to get it. Uh, looking through the list, I don't think we played with this one, but I can see it being very fun. Seer, which is a oh, yeah. cost card, plus one card, Situation. plus one action. Yeah. Reveal the top three cards of your deck. Put the ones costing from 2 to $4 into your hand. Put the rest back in any order. Uh, so worst case, it can kind of cycle through estates. Uh, but you can also combo it with, you know, cards like Laboratory, right, to kind of fix your draw through your deck strategies. Yeah, and if, if you combo that with Canal, Canal's a project that makes everything cost one fewer. Mm. So then you're drawing things that have a base cost of three to five instead, which is a much more interesting subset. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that that card being really good in certain s- strategies, but also backfiring in others. Yeah, because uh, if you put, nice. you know, if it puts back your provinces and your other five cost cards into this horrible, awful hand that you can't do much with, that's going to be no good. Yeah, it, it's it, it's good sometimes. Yeah, it's not a it's not an always. I I think something like border guard is just always going to be good. Seer can be really good sometimes and sometimes just fine. Agreed. Man, I think we, we, we have thoroughly dissected these expansions for Dominion. Anything else you guys wanted to mention regarding them? Programming note, are we going to do the third point on your three-point plan? I completely forgot what my third point on my three-point <laughs> plan is. <laughs> well, where do Come these on, sets... We don't have plans here. <laughs> this is the Thoughtful Gamer podcast. We Yeah, that's right. And when we do, we forget about them because that's not our style. <laughs> our, uh, where do these sets fit into Dominion as a whole? I think was... Oh, into the series, yeah. And yeah, we yeah. talked about this a bit. I think Nocturne fits right in with Adventures and Empires as doing kind of fundamentally different kind of wacky things to the game. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it slots right in there. As I said before, I think Renaissance fits right in with the base game and Intrigue in Seaside as kind of a a solid, fairly simple set that does good things. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I would say, um, yeah, Nocturne does fit into the recent, more complex set that sets that kind of break the game in a certain way, almost. Well, it's like uh, more fundamental changes. More fundamental changes. Yeah, exactly. And, and does it very successfully. I think, I, I kind of said this earlier, but I think Dark Ages was the least successful of these recent sets, in my opinion. And they've just gotten better and better in in, in that short span of um, complex sets. That, yeah. It, what, Empires, Adventures, and now Nocturne. Um, not in that order, I think. But in any case, yeah. The the one one thing that I kind of wish is I almost wish that the boons and hexes had been in a different set. Thematically, it works so well with the you know kind of the creepy stories you tell around the campfire theme. But I kind of wish I I think the night cards are such an awesome thing. I almost wish I had them in a separate set to the to the boons and hexes. But um, I think. Yeah, the, the set's just a solid addition, and 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 I don't think I have much to add to what what you said about adventures. Um, it's a solid uh, early expansion feeling. Sorry, sorry, yeah, Renaissance. I still think adventures is my favorite of kind of the latter half of the expansions, but I think Nocturne. Uh, I'd want to play it more. Nocturne is really compelling to me. I also would like to play Dark Ages more, but yeah, time is limited. Yeah, I'm actually in, in in agreement with you on that. Uh, adventures and then uh, Nocturne has a chance to maybe be next. Well, if you ever want to play, especially online, you know who to talk to. <laughs> I know, Ben. <laughs> Don't worry. I often sit here thinking, man, I wish I was... I could be playing Dominion, but I should actually be productive here in the evening. Or, like, <laughs> hang out with my wife. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's fair. It's fair. It's an important important thing to do. Yes. But I promise, after, especially after this week, I'll be playing more Dominion with you. All right. <laughs> I'm just Very good. touching a debate camp this week. Oh, cool. The day. Nice. Anyways, uh, I noticed that on the uh, Renaissance card list, there's a call card called Patron. So as That's we true. close uh, the podcast here, I'd like to remind you all that if you would like to become a patron of the Thoughtful Gamer and to copy the card text, toss me a coffers, uh, go to <laughs> patreon.com slash the Thoughtful Gamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Also, to help us out, you can go to iTunes or wherever you get podcasts, rate and review us. Obviously, go look at the website for game reviews and other stuff. And check me out on social media, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good night. Or day, or whenever you're listening to this. It's night here. <laughs> Whatever. Bye. Good save. Bye. Bye. <laughs>